Howdy folks, I'm Hank Sheffer, and welcome to another True Life Story, right here with Jack San Felice on Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains. In 1905 and 1906, a fellow by the name of Pete Carney came to Arizona and he decided that he was gonna look for copper. You see, electricity was just come into fashion among houses, houses all over the West, the East Coast, etc. So there was a demand now for copper. He thought if he could find this mother load of copper in Arizona, where there were already a lot of copper mines, that he could be rich beyond compare, like those who were the first to find the mother load in uh, Nevada or in California, the 49ers. The first guys get there usually get the best claims. Well, he filed several claims in and around east side of Superstition Mountain proper, next to Peralta Road. And in that particular area, he formed a camp. And so he found this camp right next to a spring, and it was called Carney Spring, that's what it was named. And they put a pipe in the ground and ran it out, and they built a little structure for it where the pipe would go through and the water would drop down so you could get it in your buckets or whatever. In fact, when I first came to Arizona in the early 90s, that pipe was still coming out of the mountain into the cement device. You could drink the water out of it. It was good water because it wasn't contaminated by um, the bacteria that would be left by animals. Uh, but later, someone, of course, tore the thing down, destroyed it. Well, it called that Carney Springs. And right next to Carney Springs, they had a camp. And they set up a camp, and they had two dozen men working on this um, particular site. Now, this site had upper and lower mines, um, and it was going to take some heavy-duty equipment and some funds. So Carney goes to back east looking for a prospector, looking for money men, and he finds a guy named Ogden Bowers. And so they called the camp, and he financed the, the one dig site. And so they called the camp Camp Bowers. And they started work, and they brought in the power drills and started working on that rock, because that's what it was. It was the side of the mountain, which was solid rock. So they, they dug a lower tunnel, and then they dug some other drifts up top, and then tried to cross cut the tunnel coming across. They were able to at one location, but just barely. But that mine in solid rock, it went 600 feet into the base of that mountain in solid rock. So they would, all they did was drill and blast and muck. Drill, blast, and muck. You had to take out the, the rock. And it was uh, actually when I, found it in the 1990s, it was still open and, and it was all solid rock and it was done so that that it was safe, so nothing was gonna fall down on you from the top. Wasn't a flat, wasn't a flat roof, it was like con concave a little bit. And uh, you could go back. I took a fella in there that was six foot nine. He had to stoop a little bit, but we, he walked the whole way in, the whole way in. And that was early on in, 1990s. Well, Carney had trouble with, with um, Bowers because Bowers expected a return on his money right away. And but, so he withdrew from it. So Carney said, well, if you did that, the heck with you, I'm going to change the name to Camp Carney, who did away with the name Bowers. So it was called Camp Carney. And he looked around in Mesa and Phoenix and he found some other people to finance him. Now, about this time, copper mining was uh, really taken off in the West. You see, after 18, uh, in 1893, when the 
gold became the standard and silver lost its value tremendously, went from $1.40 an ounce to about 20 cents an ounce. Could not make any money on silver. So all the mines in the West shut down. A lot of the mines, there were copper. In fact, the Silver King mine found copper in, in its values, and it was high grade, some high grade copper. And the Silver Queen, right down a half a mile from it, they found very high grade copper. After 200 feet down, and they didn't mine anymore. And it was taken over. That Silver Queen mine became the very famous magma mine. These guys are still working. They're still bringing money in. And they got a new, there's a new kind of drill that came out called a diamond hex drill. And they were using that new drill with diesel powered power drills. They weren't the hand drill that they were of the 1870s. This was a power drill. It was operated by diesel fluid and operate the engine and then the hose is going to it and then it would just bam, 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 bam. And it turned as it was going, bam, 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 bam. And guys would stand behind it. It looked like a machine gun is what it did on an aircraft carrier. And it, and it made that terrible noise. And so they'd drill so much, then they'd blast some, they'd insert the dynamite and blast. And then they would pull all that rock out. And at the base of that mine, from going back the 600 feet and to the right, it's all rubble now and it's all outside. Uh, some of it was hauled away. Carney, in fact, he built a road. And then the early days, these early Ford trucks had a gear in them that you didn't need four wheel drive. That thing would go just about anywhere. And so they had these old fashioned trucks, weren't old fashioned them, they were brand new. And they would haul this ore that they was gonna, he thought the, that the vein was in. And they would take that down and have it processed and try to get some money out of it. Now, what they saw when they first started looking there was green rock. And they, in the upper mines, had a lot of green rock in it. Now, in, that was in 1906 when they really started. In 1906 and 1907, there were several stories in the newspapers, the local papers, about Carney and his mines. And they would talk about how, how well it was going and mining people from the Ray Mine area and from down around San Manuel, which were big copper mines. They talked about what a good mine that this was going to be. So it was encouraging, and so Carney didn't want to give up. Also, there was an old fella by the name of Ed Cave, and his, his nickname was Old Rackensack. And he, ha he had come back to Arizona and traveled a thousand miles to see his old diggings. So he had diggings here in Arizona. And when he gets into the Phoenix area, he gives an interview and he talks about emerald gold. And what do you mean emerald gold? Well, the gold is in a green rock. And so that's what they thought that they were gonna find. As a matter of fact, up at the Daysite mines, you'll find a lot of the green rock. And this actually comes from the Daysite mines or the Kearney mines as they were also called. Daysite was a type of rock and, and it uh, found, it's a volcanic type of rock that was found up in the area of uh, that uh, part of the Superstition Mountains. So they're still, di they're, they're digging away. Now the paper comes in and they're talking about emerald gold and it's found in green and in matter of fact, at the Silver King Mine, which I'm part, I've been part of for 20 years, a lot of the uh, uh, ore up there had green in it, which is chrysocolla. Chrysocolla is, is a very greenish type rock, and that's what you see right here, chrysocolla. And that's a sign of copper. But also in the copper in Arizona, 
Almost every mine that has copper has some gold values in it. Now, Carney's starting to find gold. And the newspaper, the newspaper is talking about like this was the 49ers strike. Camp Bowers finds gold. Carney Mines finds gold. Rich find, and that's exactly what they talk about. A very rich find in at the Carney Mines. So now that draws more money into it, people that would invest, but it also draws other people to the area, prospectors, uh, claim jumpers. And, and sure enough, Carney was involved in a suit. Somebody filed suit against him, said that, he, that one of his claims, that was his claim in 1875. So he, yeah, of course, it's been expired for 40 years, but it doesn't make a difference that he still wants a foul suit on it. Well, in, in any event, that thing was settled in a hurry. So Carney is, is, is digging away, and now he's got the upper mines, and that's where he finds a lot of green. And so they're trying to dig in these upper mines and come back down because it's about 150 feet from the upper mines to the lower mines. And they dug several tunnels up there and then they drifted down and then they dug some shafts. And the more they progressed, the more prospectors come in, interlopers and uh, vagabonds, rogues. And that's where the term rogue and vagabond really applies. And they would set up their camps now, in, late, in the later days of the Kearney Mines, in 1914, they had hired this guy named Eli Korovich to be the mine foreman. Now look, they're working the mines from 1906 to 1914. That is a long time to work a mine without having a bonanza find in it or find a big load of copper or find a, a real strike. But they're finding enough just to get by on is what they were doing. Well, another group comes in and they were having some problems. This other group was shooting at their camp. And the mine foreman, the new mine foreman, Eli Korovich, so he gets his rifle and he gets three shells and he loads one of the shells and he said he's going to go over and talk to those guys, get them to stop shooting at the camp. Well, he doesn't come back that night. In the morning, they put a search party out and they come across Eli Korvich's body. He had been shot through the head, I believe through the head, at least once, and he was dead. His rifle was there and one expended shell in it and they couldn't find the other two shells. So we don't know if he fought more, he actually shot more than once. Now, the sheriff comes in and starts, in those days, this is the way it worked. The sheriff comes in and they grab everybody within the vicinity and everybody is a likely suspect. And they sometimes they just grab everybody and they grab them more than once and they bring them in to talk to them. And that was a method of operation called like a dragnet, a sweep of the area. Everybody's around, we just want to lock them up until we sort out that who's the suspect. Well, they developed three guys that were suspects. One of them was named Bert Winninger. Was a, he was a mining man and he was well known in the area. But soon as they found out Bert Winninger was grabbed up, they got, they got uh, an attorney and they convened a coroner's inquiry. A coroner's jury is put together, and that's the way they did it in those days. They pulled in a coroner's jury. It's still written in the laws and the old common laws of the back east, coroner's juries. And then they, uh, they decide there were six people in this jury, and that's normal, normal. And they have a hearing. And so after the hearing, they dismissed any charges against the three men, including Bert Winninger, that they had, had gone. And after that, the Carney Mines uh, sort of uh, faded into obscurity, but the mines are still there. And I was 
teaching at the community colleges and I was also lecturing around the area, I used to like to take them back in uh, because it was a safe mine. It was all hard rock. It wasn't going to, it wasn't a chance in the world it was going to collapse on you. And so we're going back and, the, and we get back there and go back 600 feet. I tell them what you got to look for and bring lights of all things, we boots. Because the first time I went in, there was rattles, two rattlesnakes right inside the entrance. And that's of course where rattlesnakes like to go. We get, we start to go back into bat cave and, and one of the guys in front hears this noise. You hear that rattle and oh shoot. You can't find, we can't find a rattlesnake. We couldn't see him. There was no way in the world. Well, it was a black rattlesnake is what it was. And you couldn't see that son of a gun. He was dark. I didn't kill the black rattlesnake because they're so rare. We did find them and we got him and take him and we took him out. We carried him out actually. So we got rid of the snakes and we went back. But when I started taking people back there, we go back 600 feet, dog leg, and there's bats. Now there's a few bats and I'm saying 20 to 30 bats back there. And as time progressed and a few years later, I go back again, I'm taking another group back, and you dog leg again, you go back, and at the, at the end of, almost at the end of the tunnel, you start seeing bats, but not 20 or 30, there's 200 to 300 bats. But the one thing you can't do is make loud noises. You can't holler, you can't drop stuff, you can't bang on against the walls, you can't bring uh, can canteens that are metal that bang. So you got to be quiet so you can observe them. And it's kind of really neat to see them. It's like looking at a beehive for the first time and you see all of these little bees. Well, that's what the bats are. They all just kind of like um, just hanging out. And that's what they do. They hang from their feet. So they were hanging out. So I'm bringing this guy named Jake. Jake's with our group. I'd say, Jake, whatever you do, don't say anything, keep quiet. You don't want to disturb the bats. You want to be able to see the bats and photograph and not disturb them and don't get a chance. We get back there, no problem, 600 feet. We get back there, we go another 100 feet and I put the light on and we're getting closer, 40 feet away from the bats, about 40 or 50 feet. All of a sudden, Jake goes, God almighty, look at all those bats. Guess what happens? Two or 300 bats come out of them. Because what are the bats going to do? They're going out the escape hole, which is right by us. So everybody's got to hit the floor. Brrr, one guy had a hat on. It knocked his hat off. And he is, he is petrified, OK? Petrified. And the bats. <laughs> on another occasion, we're going up to the upper day site because we want to gather some green rock. As you're going up the mountain and you start out on a semi-incline and then as you're going up, you go up, but you got to have a landmark because all the rocks look alike. And right there uh, on the way up, not too far from the day site, uh, is a large rock formation that looks like a teepee. And so I always called it teepee rock. But when you get to that rock, if you make a dog leg right, you come to a small cave and in that small cave it goes it i guess it's about 60 feet long and about 20 feet deep it's really neat it look it was an old site there that was a real cave it wasn't mine and in the floor there are in indian grind holes and they're about eight eight inches wide and they're about six to eight inches deep so some ancient indians had lived there at one time. And we know, of course, there being more water that they did live in that area. But when you get inside and you look out, it, you get to the back, it looks just like a teapot. So you see, and I always called that teapot cave. Now, it's an ancient cave, been there for hundreds of years, but most people that's gone up there for years will walk right by it because 
as you're going up, you're focused on up and you're not looking for things all around. Now in the cave at the back of the cave, there's a small niche about this thing. And in, I shined my flashlight, I thought I saw something move. And sure enough, it was a desert tortoise. He's about that long. And as soon as the light hit him, his old head popped right back in. He would not poke his head out. I didn't want to disturb him. You shouldn't disturb those, those critters. They're rare to see. And so with that done, we resume our hike up to the top. Now, as you're going, the elevation, of course, <laughs> it's not going this, it's going like this now. And it gets steeper and steeper and steeper. And just before you get to the top, there's a soft area there. It's dirt. Where it come from over the years, who knows? But it's a little tricky spot. You can trip and fall there before you get right onto the little plateau that's there. And when you get to the plateau, you start looking over to the left and you see a mine. Well, guess what? That's not the only opening. You go a little further around the bend, there's another one and it's in solid rock. And then you go over down. Now you go on, you're on top of the one particular day site mine, it's a level area, but it goes and it drops off. And when you drop off, there's some more mines to the left, some more, uh, and all of this work had been done. But what did they do with the ore? Well, when we go back to, over to the end of that plateau, there's a drop off and it, it go, it's gradual and it goes in that whole little canyon is filled with day site rock, with green rock, and it's greenish blue also. Some is, and, and that bluish color, of course, is azurite. Azurite, crystal coal, and malachite, that's the formation of, of copper, silver, and, and then you find gold in most places in the, in the copper. So that whole ravine is full of it. Now, uh, if you're real adventurous, you can look in the mines and you can take a rope in there because once you go in, the one that's uh, really good to see, you go in and it goes dry on. It's a shaft, it becomes a shaft and, and it's a deep shaft. So you wanna, if you wanna get down to the bottom of that shaft, you gotta have a long rope. And I don't recommend anybody do that. The last time I was there, we decided that we're gonna go, not go down the same way we came up. We're going down the rubble. And now you're going a long way on the rubble down this canyon and it slip and slide and fall and slip and slide and fall. And, and you got just to be careful when you get to the bottom. Seems like you're never gonna get out of the rubble. So there was a whole lot of material taken out of those Kearney mines. Back in the early 1900s, during the time when copper was sought for in Arizona and in the West. So that's basically my story of the Carney mines, except Corvich's crime was never solved. And this was 1914. And that era and beyond, there were a lot of unsolved deaths or murders in the Superstition Mountains. And Lee Corvich, Eli Corvich's story and his death is another one of those unsolved mysteries of the Superstition Mountain. Thank you for watching this episode of Mysteries of the Superstition Mountains.